topic is inside the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. Our speakers today is a panel of experts in the industry. The co-editors-in-chief of the Journal of Integrated Pest Management, Dr. Marlon Rice and Dr. Kevin Steffi, along with extension entomologist Dr. Jeff Bradshaw, will cover JIPM's four different categories and information about how to submit articles, plus an overview of the benefits of publishing in the journal. Dr. Rice is a senior research scientist with DuPont Pioneer located in Johnston, Iowa. He is nationally recognized for his work in extension entomology. He dedicated his extension career to the creative development and innovative delivery of IPM information to crop producers, agribusiness consultants, and extension educators. His efforts span 26 years at Texas A&M University, the University of Ohio, and Iowa State University, where he was a professor of entomology. From 1979 to 2009, Dr. Steffi was an extension entomologist at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he focused his educational and applied research programs on management of insect pests in corn, soybeans, and alfalfa. In mid-May 2009, he retired from the University of Illinois and started his second career as a technology transfer leader in insect management for Dow AgroSciences. He has leveraged his experience, skills, and knowledge to initiate fundamental and technical training within the company and to develop informative and educational materials and activities, including printed publications, presentations, internet-based learning activities, and interactive learning games. He also leads and manages the technology transfer function for major global projects with an insect management focus. Dr. Jeff Bradshaw is an associate professor of entomology and extension specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scottsbluff, Nebraska. He conducts research concerning various aspects of the integrated pest management of insects in specialty crops and rangeland in western Nebraska. We encourage you to post your questions in the question box during the webinar. This will allow for questions to be addressed in a timely manner. At this time, I will turn over the webinar to Dr. Jeff Bradshaw. Thank you, Travis. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation for uh, the three of us really to speak today about uh, the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. And uh, just for our audience's sake, uh, again, there are three of us speaking today, and the controls for the slides are given over to Pamela. So we will be saying next slide at the end of every slide uh, to move forward. So uh, next slide, please. So the outline for today's presentation, uh, we'll start off talking about really the, the birth of a good idea, uh, sort of a touchback here on uh, my previous webinar talking about uh, communicating to communicating science to general public. Uh, and I think JIPM uh, makes a pretty good step in that direction. And so Marlon Rice will kick us off uh, talking about um, where this idea originated from, and Kevin will join in along in that conversation as well. That will carry forward into talking about Journal of IPM as a resource for extension delivery and some information around that, the audience that's involved or the target audience, and some of the different um, categories of articles that can be submitted. And we'll pause things up at the end uh, with uh, how the Journal of IPM can lead to scholarship and extension, uh, both from a student's perspective as well as uh, from a, a career perspective. So uh, at this time, I would like you to forward next, to the next slide and hand this off to Marlon. Hey, thanks, Jeff, for that inter introduction. I, I appreciate that. Well, as Travis mentioned earlier in this presentation, both Kevin Steffi and myself were previously on the, uh, the, the faculties at um, University of Illinois and Iowa State University, respectively. Kevin was at Illinois and I was at Iowa State. And we both had extension appointments. And uh, being in, in states next to each other, we collaborated a lot on ideas. And so one day we got together and we, we started brainstorming about something. I don't remember exactly. But we came up with this idea of really needing to develop a journal specifically for an extension or outreach audience. And so that was in the year 2007-2008. Uh, 
And we actually took this idea to a group of our colleagues, peer extension entomologists in the north central states, and said, hey, what do you think about this idea of coming up with a journal specifically for an extension audience that has some unique aspects to it? And uh, everybody was on board, at least uh, verbally. And so what we did was we pushed this idea forward, and we, we talked about it, and we worked on it, and we came up with really a vision for this journal that has four aspects to it. And in this slide, you see those four aspects are that the journal would be extension-oriented or developed specifically for an outreach audience, somebody who's uh, not necessarily a, a peer scientist, but it could be. The second uh, bullet point is that this journal would be peer-reviewed. And we really think that this is uh, critical for this journal, that if we're going to publish uh, articles that are um, of value, not only for ourselves but for our audience, that if we peer review these articles, that will uh, add another layer of uh, really professionalism to uh, extension articles that we had, had possibly done in the past and would do in the future. The third bullet point is that this journal would be web-based, and of course you know that the internet is, is the way to go in, in delivery of information today. And then the fourth aspect for uh, this journal would be that it would be open access. And this is really kind of unique, or it is unique, for the ESA journals. The uh, other journals, such as Environmental Entomology, uh, Journal of Economic Entomology, the Annals of the ESA, uh, those are not open access. You can only get those online if you're a member. So we wanted something that was a little bit different for this uh, journal, Journal of Integrated Pest Management. And so being extension-oriented, being web-based, and being open access were three unique points that uh, we put together for this idea whenever we developed uh, the concept. Next, please. Now, we had a rationale for this idea. And the first bullet point says that there is significant decline in full-time equivalents in extension entomology. What Kevin and I saw was that because of budget cuts and retirements among our peers, there were fewer and fewer extension entomologists over the years. And so what that told us was that if we're going to deliver a message to a broad audience, we've really got to work together. Not only could, should, we shouldn't confine our, our thoughts and our resources just, just within a state boundary. We really need to work outside the state boundaries because, again, uh, we just didn't have the critical manpower or mass within some states to get extension work done. So because of this decline, we need to look create creativity excuse me, creatively as to how we would deliver a message. Secondly, we know that the pest complex, regardless of, of what the, uh, the crop may be or the situation may be, is changing. There's also changing pest behaviors. And of course, we have continually evolving pest management options. Some of the pest complexes that are changing um, within the last decade, we've got things like Asian longhorn beetle in northeastern US. We've got brown marmorated stink bug on the east coast. We've got the Bagrata bug in California, uh, emerald ash borer in the north central states. Then we've got western corn rootworm changing its behavior in the Midwest. So these insects are creating additional challenges for us that uh, we need to address and provide information on regarding biology, ecology, or control. And we think that JIPM is a, a great uh, resource for delivering that. Third bullet point, we've got clientele seeking information on the internet. We all know that. Oftentimes, when, even when we want information, the first place we go is the Internet. So we wanted to have something that was available there. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Environmental Protection Agency have all stated that there needs to be a place where pest management information can be delivered quickly, responsibly, and be available to a broad audience. And so we felt like JIPM could be that vehicle for the delivery of that information. And then the last bullet point on this slide, Kevin and I really felt strongly that if we're going to produce a product that is going to be supported by the Entomological Society of America, that we wanted to have articles that were peer-reviewed. Now, typically, extension articles are not peer-reviewed. Oftentimes, they're published in-house within a state, and uh, maybe your colleague across the hallway looks at it. But we wanted to have these articles peer-reviewed because we felt like that would add a, a layer of professionalism to these articles that had not occurred in the past. Next, please. So the scope of the journal, uh, we really wanted it to be multidisciplinary. Now, of course, it's being produced by the Entomological Society of America. 
but we wanted to cover the entire spectrum of pests. So that would include nematology, plant pathology, weed science, and other subject areas. For instance, last year we actually had an article published on the management of wild turkeys. And that's not something that uh, <clears throat> you probably think traditionally as being a pest, but it went through a peer review process and was accepted. And so we were glad to have that article. The scope of the journal also will include original extension type articles. And what we will not be doing is we will not be publishing original unpublished research, but we would use research to support the extension type article. And one of the um, ways of describing this that I've told people in the past is these original extension type articles, if you just think of these kind of like a, a mini annual review of entomology article in which you reference published research to develop a concept and build a storyline, and then you can come up with an extension type article that addresses a pest or a particular problem. And of course, the Journal of IPM covers a whole gamut of pest situations. You can see there's a few of them there listed in the last bullet point. But it can be row crops, it can be forestry, it can be urban environments, it can be households, it can be livestock and pets, or even human health. So any place where a pest occurs and has an impact on uh, humans or their environment, there's an opportunity to publish an article there. So who will read uh, articles in JIPM? Next slide, please. Well, anybody that's seeking information on integrated pest management, crop producers, crop protection professionals such as foresters, retailers, manufacturers, suppliers of pest management products, educators, pest control operators, and we could also list in there our peers, other entomologists. Anybody that's looking for information on a particular pest could find that in JIPM or they could submit an article to JIPM regarding their pest of interest. Next slide, please. So what type of articles will we be asking for? Well, there's, uh, there's four categories. You've got three of them listed here. One is a pest biology and ecology profile. And what I like to think of here is everybody that's uh, in graduate school writes either a, this, a thesis or a dissertation. And in that thesis or dissertation, typically you put a, uh, a literature review. And it's rare that that literature review ever gets published. It's, it's almost a disposable chapter. It's certainly valuable to your research in uh, helping set the direction of what you're going to study. But when it comes time to bind that thesis and put it in the library shelf, that literature review usually doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. So what I have told a number of students is if you're working on a pest species and you have a literature review, usually you have a very strong chapter on pest biology, ecology, and maybe even management. And certainly that would be an opportunity there to take that literature review for your particular insect and submit it to JIPM as a pest biology or ecology profile. Second bullet point, uh, what we're looking for is emerging IPM issues. Um, I work in the Midwest, and certainly an issue that we have here is western corn rootworm developing resistance to transgenic or GMO corn. So that's an emerging IPM issue, which uh, certainly would love to have articles about that uh, people could access on the web. And then lastly, we're looking for a consensus-based pest management recommendations. When I say consensus-based, go back to the thought that I gave you earlier about working across multiple states, uh, maybe developing a recommendation from the states in the southeast regarding a particular pest, or some other region in the country in which you bring your colleagues together and everybody comes together to develop a pest management um, series of recommendations that help um, the reader understand and control that particular pest based upon the information that you've provided. Okay, next slide, please. So with this idea in mind, Kevin Steffi and I approached the uh, Entomological Society of America Governing Board in 2009 with this idea, and we got approval to move forward with this. And shortly thereafter, we had the first call for papers. And if you go to the ESA website and look under journals, you can see more information, written information, on the purpose, scope, type of articles we're looking for, which I just talked about, and the readership. So there's a, an address right there. Again, you can just go to the ESA website and find that. But the following year, we published our first issue, and now it's all online with the web, ad web address right there. And so it's accessible to anybody in the world. 
<laughs> Next slide, please. So at this point, I've uh, I've talked for a few minutes. I appreciate you listening to me, and I'm going to hand this off to my colleague, uh, Kevin Steffi, at this point. Kevin, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. All right, Great. thanks. Okay, you bet. Thank you uh, very much. That uh, Marlon describes uh, what I can only refer to as a labor of love. Uh, when Marlon first came up with this idea and pitched it to me, I thought it was a terrific idea. We pursued it and have achieved some level of success, and we want to make this even more successful, um, which is uh, more or less the uh, objective of um, this webinar this afternoon. I'm going to reiterate what Marlon uh, indicated before. Initially, there were three categories of articles. You see the nice little icons created by the ESA staff here for profiles, issues, and recommendations. And we actually added an an additional category in 2011 in response to some of the submitters uh, called case study. And I think the point I want to make here on this slide is we are not married uh, to all of the uh, categories that currently exist. Any of you who publish in uh, the Journal of Economic Entomology realize that categories change all the time and we are willing to consider other ideas. Uh, so right now we have four categories, but who knows what the future will bring as people uh, come up with innovative ideas for how to present information in this particular journal. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So let's ask the question, why should I publish in JIPM? Uh, and this is directed uh, clearly to students or anyone else listening in. If you want to be read, uh, we are very proud of the statistics over uh, 2012 and 2013 that five or six of the most downloaded ESA articles were from the JIPM. This comes from it being open access, and uh, that was our original intent, obviously. Uh, try to get this message out there. So if you want to be read, this is a great place to go to try to publish the um, uh, results of your efforts. Maximizing your influence. As we've said more than once, it's freely accessible to everyone. Um, again, that goes back to our original intent to make sure that the information available in the uh, Journal of Integrated Pest Management could be accessed by people who could um, put this into use. And to build your resume, uh, obviously if you're um, angling toward an extension effort in your future, or if you are um, uh, simply trying to flesh out your resume, showing that you can interact with the public, uh, these articles in JIPM will go a long way toward accomplishing that. Next slide, please. This is a slide thanks to Alan Kahn. He put this together to show our history of key statistics uh, from 2010, the first year of publication, first full year of publication, all the way to 2013. And there's a uh, lot of information on this chart, so uh, don't intend for you to uh, remember all of it. Uh, we had a banner year in 2012, and quite frankly, a bit of a dip in 2013. And one of the reasons we are doing this webinar is to try to encourage people to carry on the momentum that we thought we developed in 2012. Um, the number of articles published in 2012 were 21, as you can see, submissions 22. Uh, you can see the number withdrawn. One of the things that Marlon and I did from the very outset 
is decided that when uh, submissions were sent, we would uh, look at them quickly and decide whether they met the criteria for the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. And if they did not, we uh, simply withdrew them to give the authors an opportunity to publish in another ESA journal if they so desired. Uh, so our acceptance rate, I think, is uh, very well in keeping with the other ESA journals. And look at the number of downloads. Uh, those are impressive. Uh, you can see that the uh, column under 2013 is uh, s sort of still being formulated because the data are not all in. Uh, as indicated, two manuscripts are still in process. But to reiterate, five of the ten most downloaded DSA journal articles were from JIPM in 2013 and six in 2012. So if you want your stuff to be read, uh, this particular journal is uh, an excellent outlet for that. Next slide, please. Just to give you an overview uh, based on the types of articles published, and this, this is not terribly uh, surprising. 25 profiles, 20 issues, 5 recommendations, and 2 case studies. Uh, the latter has a small number, obviously, uh, given the uh, relative newness of that category. But to go back to uh, one of Marlon's comments, and I know Jeff is going to reiterate this as well, if you've got a literature review, uh, want to publish what's uh, otherwise typically not published, the profile is the way to go. Uh, you can uh, publish an overview of an uh, insect pest, indicating the biology and ecology of that insect, and um, that's a great opportunity for publication. Issues are another one. Issues, as we all know, develop all the time in integrated pest management. And any hot issue is always welcome for submission for this, um, for this journal. <clears throat> Skip down a line, and it says uh, that most of the articles obviously have been published for insects. We've had a couple for plant diseases, a couple uh, regarding insects as transmitters of plant disease. And we'd like to see more from the other IPM disciplines. Uh, clearly, as an ESA journal, this is one that um, uh, seems to sort of direct itself toward insects. But we are open to all comers, if you will. Um, as indicated, and Marlon's already alluded to this, uh, we've had an article published about turkey management, as well as mollusks in the form of slugs and crustaceans in the form of tadpole shrimp. So we are trying to reach out to our uh, sister organizations to get some of their scientists to publish within JIPM. And uh, we think we've got a very bright future. The one last thing I'd like to uh, mention before we hand it off to Jeff is we are encouraging international publications. Uh, thus far, we've had uh, five articles published outside the U.S. And just recently, I got a very nice um, uh, submission for uh, pest management on a corn, I believe, in Mexico. So we are going to make a special effort to our um, international branch to try to get people to submit articles to this journal. So with that, that sort of provides a uh, very quick overview, rationale, uh, current statistics, et cetera, for the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. And I gladly hand it over to Jeff, who's had some experience with this journal. So Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next slide, please. So as Marlon alluded to earlier, and I believe Kevin touched on as well, there are a number of 
what we call scholarly outputs or um, avenues for product delivery in extension. And what I've listed here certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but in terms of opportunities for extension faculty, obviously we have different online periodicals we can go to at our various institutions. Uh, all of us have access to some sort of unified process for, um, for content delivery. Uh, usually in most systems we've got uh, what I would call in-depth circulars. So these are in-house publications that do, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, at UNL, for example, we have an internal uh, sort of peer review process. But as Marlon mentioned earlier, uh, these are either across the hall reviews uh, and likely are not going to be external uh, and certainly not blind reviews. Um, we have a lot of different avenues for online content, again, uh, like the Northern Plains IPM Guide or the High Plains IPM Guide. As Marlon mentioned earlier, these are largely multi-state efforts uh, engaging in a larger community of extension professionals to generate these. But again, these aren't uh, peer-reviewed, certainly not in the traditional sense of, of peer-reviewed. And of course, we've got decision support systems that many of us are actively developing these days and other online media uh, via podcasts and whatnot. So we have these different avenues um, uh, for extension uh, scholarly output. Um, but uh, you know, for extension, you know, many, are, many, again, of these are not subjected to peer review. And additionally, few of these um, uh, avenues for output have access to professional editorial and production staff. Some of them do, but I think a, a good point to make with JIPM is uh, when you when you purchase that service, you're also purchasing uh, a great amount of power and professionalism in getting your material edited properly. Next slide, please. So this point has been made a couple of times. So obviously, uh, you can see we're pushing this uh, agenda pretty hard, particularly in terms of the vein of opportunities for students uh, and, and maybe for people that have um, moved beyond student status. You, know, you might be able to dust off some old found documents off the shelf. What do you think, Kevin? Maybe? Um, and, uh, and publish them in JIPM. Obviously, some of them might need to be updated and uh, made more current. But what did you do with the introductory chapter of the document that you're either currently working on or have worked on? And I think Marlon made this point earlier, as did Kevin. Um, there are many, many of these sitting on shelves in libraries that I feel or we feel could be better used if translated to the greater public. Any uh, so, what, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. Can I interrupt? I think there might be solar flares. Kevin's breaking up. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I've got a literature review of turkey chiggers that never got published, and um, I'm starting to rethink that. I think it's a great idea. It's a, it's a great opportunity to breathe new life into uh, more mature documents. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, next slide, please. Wait for that to pop up here. Thank you, Pamela. So uh, that's what I did with, with uh, part of my dissertation. I collaborated with the, uh, the senior author here is Bayoung Hadi. Uh, he was a graduate student, or not a graduate student, a postdoc at the time. And you know, obviously, I had already put a lot of work into that literature review document. And uh, I saw an opportunity here to involve somebody else in the process, a fresh set of eyes, if you will, um, as maybe just a different way of looking at um, of that document to bring it to uh, uh, bring new light to it, I guess you could say. And so what I've documented before the the or below the title of that and citation of that publication, you can see that it was a, basically a five hundred dollar publication fee, which uh, I think isn't all that bad. Um, the submission time, we submitted this public for publication uh, on uh, October 21st, 2011, and uh, we got the proof back on January 30th of 2012. And so that was 100 days from submission to proof, which might be a little long, about three months, uh, but I think it's important to bear in mind there that um, that span of time does include, for most of us, uh, fairly significant holiday time. 
and I think most journals uh, experience some lag in review time uh, in that process. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that um, really excited me about uh, publishing in GIPM was it was a terrific venue for high quality and creative products. So you can see here are a couple really nice color plates uh, that are from that publication that, uh, that I produced with Bayung Hadi and, and Marlon Rice and John Hill. And it gives us an opportunity to maybe show some, uh, some images and uh, really nice reformatted uh, images that uh, you might not see commonly. These are common questions that we could address uh, with these figures in terms of the different color phases that you see with the beanleaf beetle, uh, some of the different characteristics in its life cycle. I don't know that there are a whole lot of publications with images of um, Saratoma trifurcata larvae out there. And then, of course, it also gives an opportunity to show damage, different damage types, and different stages of the soybean plant in this case uh, that are affected in different ways uh, by bean leaf beetles. So again, I think this gave me a really great opportunity to uh, move forward some content that I had developed in my introductory chapters of my dissertation. Uh, and it uh, allowed for a bit more creative expression, uh, some peer review in that, and uh, you know maybe a bit more, uh, hopefully along with that peer review, um, and making this document open, openly available to the public, uh, created a, a platform that's a little more easily to get a hold of. So next slide, please. So I surveyed uh, some other authors, uh, at least uh, a brief survey from of authors that have published from 2010 to 2013. Uh, I got a 30% response rate, which isn't too bad because I didn't give people too much uh, lead time in, in this little survey that I sent out. But I do appreciate the authors, uh, particularly if you're listening, I, I thank you now uh, for participating in this survey. I asked three simple questions. Uh, why did you choose JIPM? What worked for you in the submission review process? And what would you like to see improved or added? And so the next couple slides are going to provide some of these answers and then uh, wrap this up on uh, some of my future thoughts uh, for JIPM. Next slide, please. So by and large, uh, in response to the question of why did you choose JIPM, um, kind of the overriding theme was that it was a very appropriate journal. It was appropriate for a number of reasons. One reason that was that it was a general integrated pest management journal. So uh, the authors have viewed it. Uh, not as necessarily as just an insect or just an entomology publication, but that it's applicable from things from, um, you know, viruses and plants to turkeys. Uh, and so that was, that created a, an appeal for choosing GIPM. Uh, the opportunity maybe to reach new audiences, uh, I think uh, specifically, I know we've brought up the turkey paper a couple of times here, but I know that uh, that author in particular thought that by using GIPM, he was tapping into a new audience. And so for maybe some of you online now, you might already be thinking about your GIPM article that you'd like to submit, and maybe this is true for you as well. Of course, this has been stressed by us. Uh, it's also true, it's what authors have said, that open access is a really important thing uh, with GIPM, that it's extension oriented, and that um, because of uh, the, the common language that we can use, uh, the non-technical language that we can use in GIPM to describe some of these uh, pest management aspects, uh, it creates a greater appeal to practitioners. So that's, that's the hope for the authors and why they choose GIPM. Next slide, please. So in terms of what worked well uh, for you as the author uh, in submission and re in the review process, um, pretty much for the most part, everyone said that it was a simple submission process, uh, that it worked well for them. Uh, they liked the online interface that's used for submitting GIPM articles. Um, and there's sort of a, a slim majority that said it was a quick review. I think uh, at least of the 30% that responded to my survey, um, most of them said it was a quick review process. There were a few that thought maybe the review could have been a little faster, um, and again, I think you could say the same for reviewers uh, across the board. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, some of that is going to depend on time of year when submissions are made. Next slide, please. So along with that, uh, when I asked 
what would you like to see improved or added to GIPM? Uh, some of some authors, uh, current or former authors, in, uh, ask that uh, there be an improved time and efficient efficiency uh, from review to galley. Um, there were some concerns about that. Maybe some room to grow there. Um, that and I and I think this is an important point. Uh, a couple of authors made it a point to say that there should be an updated web interface for GIPM. Uh, if you look at the public uh, library of science online, uh, FOSS One, for example, you have a really nice interface that makes it really easy to find the PDF download. Uh, they have um, uh, uh, data on readership that's available uh, that you can see on the website. And they even have a social media link uh, via Facebook. So you can see how many times their, their inline web articles have been forwarded through to uh, Facebook, and I'm going to touch on that a bit more later. So um, there were some other points about uh, in terms of kind of uh, dovetailing both submissions and promotion of JIPM together in terms of maybe uh, engaging in some invited submissions, and I think we've done a little bit of that, but maybe a bit more effort there. And uh, and I think probably a broader concern is maybe some reviewer education, and by that I mean um, maybe. Uh, discussing uh, again with reviewers about what or highlighting what the point of GIPM is. Uh, I think Marlon made this point earlier on in the presentation that this largely is not, uh, is not a place for a, a primary research article to go. Uh, a lot of these are going to be reviews or recommendations as were pointed earlier. And so maybe these need to be viewed uh, as a reviewer in a slightly different light than you would uh, an article where you have materials and methods uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So I think the point I'd like to make with this slide is that, um, and this is sort of my wrap-up slide, um, we've been communicating for a long time. Uh, this, 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 is, this is rock art, if it's not uh, obviously clear here. This rock imagery was scrawled. Uh, maybe uh, I think by Bronze Age scribes somewhere in southern Sweden around 1500 BC. So we've been um, using our our hands to communicate for quite some time, uh, a very long time actually. Um, and apart from the development of written language uh, and then the printing press, few advancements really compare to the communication tools that we literally have at our fingertips today. Particularly when you think about our our iPhones, tablets, and various mobile devices. And what I would like to see, kind of thinking forward um, to a, a GIPM future, would be um, for GIPM to be more engaged in this new communication media, uh, seeking out new avenues to push content forward. For example, reaching back to that FOSS example, um, I, I think connecting the Facebook and social media by the articles gives us maybe a new platform to push uh, our GIPM content forward, make it more part of the public conversation uh, in and separate more from uh, some of those theses and dissertations that we have sitting on library shelves somewhere, actually making our content part of the conversation. And I think in a small way, the STEP committee, the um, student, uh, student transition and early, profession, early professional committee in ESA, uh, has been charged uh, by Frank Zalem, our, our current ESA president, in taking on some of these tasks. Uh, we've got some. Uh, agenda items uh, that he has given us uh, to look at uh, developing maybe some video shorts as well as um, trying to uh, encourage greater publication with GIPM. And what I would like to see is us marrying some of this video content with some of our GIPM articles uh, to give um, maybe greater content, to push more content forward in new and in more diverse ways. Um, and so uh, I think we can do both, uh, and, I, and I think we can make that happen in a mutually beneficial way. Next slide, please. So uh, again, I think uh, we, uh, Kevin, Marlon, and myself all thank you for joining us on the call today. Uh, we really want to extend an invitation here uh, to publish in JIPM to follow up on what some of those authors have said that, that we should make a greater effort towards. And, um, and I think it, it's worked well for me, although I haven't, I haven't published there quite as much as I would like to have uh, at this point. 
Um, but really want to uh, invite more authors to publish in GIPM, and I would like to see us to be able to leverage um, uh, an improved website design and maybe finding new ways to push that content forward. And I guess I would open this up for any comments that Kevin or Marla would want to say with this, this closing slide as well before we pass this on to Travis for some closing comments. Well, this is Marlon. I would just thank you, Jeff, for that uh, following up on the, uh, the rest of the presentation. I would just say to those that are online, if you have any questions, I believe there's a place where you can type a message there and send that to us, and we can respond to that if you'd like to do that at this point. Yes, you actually have several questions. And if Kevin doesn't have any other um, closing remarks, we can start the Q&A segment. Uh, Pam, let's go with the Q&A. All right. Your first question, who will provide peer review for industry professionals? Well, I'll answer that. Uh, Kevin and I have uh, a large handful of subject editors. I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere around 15. Do you remember, Kevin? I think that's close. Mark. Yeah, that's close. So whenever we re receive a manuscript, and these are assigned to Kevin and me in alternating order uh, from the ESA office, whenever I get a manuscript, I go to my list of subject editors, and I find a person there that I think maybe has uh, some knowledge of the subject of the manuscript. They don't have to be an expert on that particular topic, but uh, somebody may be in the area, and I, that manuscript is assigned to that subject editor, and then that subject editor uh, then selects two anonymous peer reviewers. So if, if there's a manuscript that comes in from somebody in the industry, uh, the selection of a peer reviewer is entirely at the discretion of the subject editors. And uh, I don't know that there's any uh, preference for somebody in industry to review an article, and certainly they're not excluded. It's, uh, I think the process is probably just similar to every other journal that we have within uh, ESA. It's uh, based upon somebody that can give a fair uh, review of the article and uh, return the manuscript back to the subject editor quickly. Kevin, other comments? Yeah, Marlon, if I can add on to that. Uh, we are trying to make a concerted effort not only to invite students to submit to JIPM, but also to invite industry authors. And uh, we recently added another subject editor who is within the industry. So uh, Marlon's comments are right on point. Uh, we have a great panel of subject editors. So uh, industry submissions are welcome and uh, will be dealt with just like the other manuscripts. Okay, great. I think you touched on this during the presentation, but a question may need a little bit, this question may need a little bit more elaboration. Do you accept articles about IPM in, outside of the U.S.? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Depending on the content of the publication or the uh, submission, I showed a uh, statistic that um, I think five of the uh, articles thus far published have been from outside the U.S. We encourage that. Uh, we want to see that grow. And we are going to try to work with the international branch to make it grow as long as people understand the intent of the publication. I, can, I concur, you. yes. Yeah. Uh, we, would, we would love to have manuscripts uh, submitted from an international audience. Uh, again, make sure they follow the, the guidelines that are posted on the web regarding the content of the article. But yeah, we'd love to have more. Great. Your next question. Are studies that are concluded with only one year of field data appropriate for JIPM? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and, and, and whenever I get a question like this, I, I kind of uh, 
I, I have to couch my answer somewhat uh, carefully because I, I don't want to uh, offend anybody. But uh, again, um, this is not a, research, a primary research journal. So if somebody has field research that they want to publish, regardless of how many years that they have, this is really not the place for that information. Now, there, there is a, a caveat to that. Certainly, if somebody is writing an article that's, uh, say, a pest management recommendation, uh, I'll pick one, black cutworms in corn, they may have some field data that they will use to support that recommendation, but the journal is, is not a place to publish uh, unpublished original research. Okay? If, if, if that's, if there's, there's a subtle distinction there that's a little hard sometimes for people to understand. But we certainly, certainly want to use research to support the document. But in that context, usually that research has already been published in a, in a research peer-reviewed journal. And then that research is referenced in the JITM article. Kevin? Yeah. I agree, Marlon. Um, yeah, that's a uh, kind of a uh, broad. Well, that that uh, question is uh, hard to answer with a uh, specific response. So, Marlon's response is fine, and uh, we want to make sure that people don't encourage publishing stuff with just one year of research because we're not going to accept with JIPM, we're not going to accept um, uh, original research, even if it's just one year. Yeah, and, and to, to follow up on that, uh, two, two items. One is, if, if there's an author out there that has an idea for a manuscript, and they are uncertain as to whether they're headed off in the right direction as they're writing or what they should include or not include, uh, they can contact either Kevin or myself and say, hey, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Am I on track or am I off track? And we can have a discussion that will help them decide sort of which direction to move or to uh, abandon the effort or encourage the effort, whichever it may be. So. I, I really tell people that if you've got any questions, just give us a call, and we'd be glad to talk to you about that. The second point is, regarding the original research, one question I like for authors to ask is, could this manuscript that they are currently writing, could it be published in Environmental Entomology or the Journal of Economic Entomology as a research article? And if the answer is yes, then it must go there, because in our uh, presentation on the governing board, they wanted to make sure that the Journal of Integrated Pest Management did not compete directly with Environmental Ent or JEE. And so that's why this is strictly an extension-based journal and not a research-focused journal. Excellent. Our next question. Can you comment on the suitability of focusing a single species when it often occurs as a part of a pest complex? Sure, I, I could address that. Uh, I work on corn. Uh, there's a handful of Lepidopteran species that attack corn. There's corn earworm, fall armyworm, sugarcane borer, southwestern corn borer, European corn borer. I could pick any one of those, uh, European corn borer being an example, and I could write a pest biology and ecology profile just on European corn borer, even though it's a complex of, of, of a larger complex of species attacking a particular crop. Now, now certainly if somebody wanted to tackle you know the broader spectrum, go for it. But yeah, it's uh, you know the single pest manuscript is often the easiest to do and it's often the easiest to uh, read and comprehend. And Marlon, just to add to that, um, guarding multiple species, that could turn into um, issues article, uh, possibly a recommendations article, and obviously a case study. 
So the, the implications of uh, more than one species can be incorporated into a number of possibilities. Sure. And as you said earlier, Kevin, you know, we've got some categories there, but those are not hard and fast categories. That's uh, right. We, we extend uh, the invitation for, for creativity on uh, anybody's part. Uh, you know, don't be confined by a potential box. Uh, if you've got an idea, give us a call, and uh, we can talk about your idea for a manuscript. So uh, be creative, have an extension focus, and uh, use original research that's already published to, uh, to support your manuscript. You know, another example of that, uh, Marlon and Kevin, might be, you know, early season cutworm control. You know, we've got areas of the country that have more than one cutworm that are active early in the season, and I could see a recommendation paper that, that could be developed um, using a complex of species that we just commonly call cutworms. Yeah, Jeff, I look forward to you writing that manuscript and getting it submitted. <laughs> Thank you, Marlon. <laughs> You're I, welcome. I knew I, I'm, I'm so glad I spoke up. <laughs> We have a question from the audience. We have a question from Jesus Morales. Jesus, are you available? It sounds like he's having some feedback. So let's take another question. Our next question is, can we add a chapter per issue using select articles from Anthropod Management Test? Maybe the author can enhance the article with pictures and video. Uh, boy, that's that that falls within that arena of creativity that I just talked about. Uh, you know, I I think Kevin and I haven't we had a discussion about arthropod management test uh, in the past, Kevin, as to where that might fit within JIPM. Yes, I am, that has some very uh, specific guidelines for how those uh, manuscripts are published, and we feel. Uh, fairly strongly that if you build those out, uh, you can develop a fantastic article for the Journal of IPM. Um, it depends on how you build them, and I reiterate Marlin's comment that give us a call, let us talk to you, uh, but AMT articles, absolutely, those are possible for uh, building into JIPM articles. Yeah, and, ex and, and those are the type of data that can be used to support a pest management recommendation. Yeah. Just, again, yeah. Jeff talked about early season cutworms. You know, you could, you could do your literature search on um, early season cutworm species, whatever you're talking about, and, you know, mine the data out of uh, AMT uh, articles and then use that to, uh, to write your extension article on uh, specific control measures for that particular insect. Yep. So I, and, and including video, yes, very much so. And then, uh, you know, Jeff showed his article on bean leaf beetles. One thing that I, I emphasize when I talk to potential authors is this is electronic, this is online. Uh, load this thing up with color images, high quality color images of the, the insect, various life stages. Uh, crop injury, that sort of thing. Uh, it always surprises me when I get a manuscript that has no pictures in it. So uh, go online, look at Jeff's article on bean leaf beetles. Uh, I don't remember what year that was published, but look at some of the examples that are there. I had one on stock borers published probably in uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 2010 or early 2011. Look at those as examples as to what can be done, and uh, be sure to include lots of images when you submit a manuscript. It, it creates visual appeal and uh, makes the article much more uh, entertaining to read. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Our final question for this afternoon is, what is the position of JIPM on reporting a specific product formulations in the recommendation section? Well, uh, I don't know. I guess I haven't encountered that. Uh, I guess it will, I'd have to read the manuscript to see what the uh, the content was, the uh, the scope, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I guess if there's some chemistry out there that is uh, uh, unique, novel, and uh, is taking care of a specific problem, and there's no other solutions, then that would probably be appropriate. 
but uh, you know we we'd want to make sure that there were not um, competing products that were intentionally being excluded as part of the recommendation. So I I would say give us a call. Let's talk about it. Uh, otherwise, write it up and submit it, and we'll send it through peer review and see what the anonymous reviewers think. Kevin? Yeah, I agree with that. Well, thanks. Well, thank you for your questions. I want to remind everyone that this webinar, along with all of our ESA webinars, will are archived under our ESA website under the Education tab. And a follow-up email will go to all attendees giving you the exact link for this webinar once it's posted on the website. Um, I am going to now close our Q&A segment and turn it over to Travis. Thanks, Pamela. At this time, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Rice, Dr. Steffi, and Dr. Bradshaw, as well as Pamela for their help and their involvement in today's webinar. I would also like to thank all of you for your participation. Uh, participation in today's webinar, and we look forward to your participation in our next webinar occurring next Wednesday, April 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Well, graduate research assistant Louise Lynch will lead the topic on citizen science. Future uh, ESA webinar topics also include that of our Job Hunting 200 series, writing your CV, resume, portfolio, career development, the resources to finding a job, in the transition into your first job. Other great topics coming soon also include that of ESA science policy and learning more about ICE 2016. Thanks again for your participation today.